Actually, I'm really glad the uh, first two speakers spoke about what they did because that gives a little bit of introduction to some of what I'm going to be talking about. So we're looking at uh, CO2 dissolved in water, but um, we're not looking at the applications from the first speaker. We're actually coming at it from a perspective of a bioreactor. So in a bioreactor, you have a small volume of fluid that you want to grow some stuff in proteins or whatever, and you need to feed it. And often the feed is CO2, and you want to get that CO2 distributed through your bioreactor in an efficient way. And you know the, the industrial way is to put it on a food processor, whack it on full speed, and it mixes very fast, very uniformly, but it also destroys the, the, the stuff you're trying to bioreact and grow. So you really want to mix it with very low shear. There's been a lot of interest in, in recent days to look at what they call a soft mixer. And the perspectives in the soft mixers has been, okay, can we come up with a good Lagrangian mixing strategy for passive scalars. But as we saw in the first talk this morning, CO2 dissolved in water isn't a passive scalar. It changes the density of the water, not too much. In the uh, parameter ratings we're going to be looking at, the CO2 changes the density of water by less than a few percent. So we can use a Bosonesque approximation for that and look at the uh, buoyancy effects in the uh, in the hydrodynamics. <clears throat> and so we're not constrained so much by good efficient Lagrangian mixes in the passive scalar sense because we're also going to take advantage of the fact that the CO2 isn't a passive scalar. So this work has been done with uh, Jason who's a <coughs> colleague of mine at ASU, he's in the high performance computing, so we were responsible more for the simulations. And then Mia Hertha, I've been collaborating with him for about 30 years. He's at RPI, Rensselaer up in New York. He and his uh, large group of students were responsible for the experimental component. So let me give you, let's see if I can get this in. Yeah, an overview. So <clears throat> Amir and I have been working on surfactants, which brings in the second speaker's talk this morning, for many years. <clears throat> and we've been interested in sort of characterizing uh, the shear viscosity associated with the fact in so many years. And this um, knife edge viscometer setup is what we're going to use for this model bioreactor. So what it consists of is a stationary cylinder, either set of schematic, stationary, um, cylinder, radius R, height H. In the experiments I'm going to be showing you, R and H are both two and a half centimeters. Completely filled with water to the rim. Everything's very carefully machined so that the interface stays flat. <clears throat> he lays down a monomolecular film of surfactant. In, in this case here, we're using an insoluble surfactant, steric acid, <clears throat> which happens to have a well-characterized excess surface shear viscosity associated with it. And in bioreactors, part of the uh, byproducts are often surface active, whether they're proteins or whatever, they come to the surface. And so we, we, we're using this well-characterized, well-controlled steric acid monolayer as a model for that. And, and a lot of people think that that's a uh, design fault, but we're going to use it as a, to our advantage. And once that monolayer is laid uniformly, constant, um, constant surface concentration, so there's no Marangoni effects, like we were told about in the first talk, they very carefully bring down this cylinder with a sharp edge here, the knife edge, and that has to be very carefully machined. It just come into contact with a gas-liquid interface, and once that 
is done, it is set in motion to rotate at a constant rate, omega radians squared, uh, radians per second. Now, if the monolayer wasn't there, we just had pure, clean air-water interface, just the liquid that's in contact directly with the knife edge would move and not much else. And you just get a little bit of circulation there, but not much else. With a viscous monolayer, what happens is that <clears throat> it's viscously dragging the whole interface with it. And so <clears throat> inside the knife edge, so it, you know, this is the axis of symmetry, the azimuth of velocity is zero by symmetry, and here it's rotating at whatever rate the thing is. If it's very viscous, it ends up having a azimuth of velocity that goes proportional to R. So it's basically a solid body, like you would get if you had a, a rigid lid disc rotating. If it's not very viscous, it, it, it instead of being proportional to R, it sort of drops off. And as you go to the limit of to the limit of inviscid, you, you just get nothing, zero, and then coming up to a, almost like a jump discontinuity. The concentration gradient, uh, the concentration of steric acid we're using is not too high, so it's not quite solid body in here. It's it's slow, but it's rotating. Out here, you get the opposite, right? It's rotating fast and then decreasing all the way to zero. So if you like, it's almost like a Rankine vortex type distribution on the surface. And what that does then is that you've got angular momentum coming off of here, looping around. And so that means you've got axial gradients and angular momentum. And those axial gradients and angular momentum drive an azimuthal component of vorticity, which gives you a large scale overturning flow. And so this whole volume of liquid is overturning. And it's driven by the monolayer. So that sounds like it's going to mix stuff through here. Yeah, going to sleep. Now, <clears throat> if this rate of rotation is not too fast, this 3D flow stays axisymmetric and reaches steady state in some fraction of the viscous time. You know, water and the, uh, I'm going to use the uh, radius of the knife edge, about half of the radius of the cylinder, so one and a quarter centimeters. The viscous time in this setup is about just under three minutes, 173 seconds. So this is what we did back a few years to sort of characterize a, a bunch of different model layers to, to measure their surface shear viscosity. What we're doing now is instead of having just air everywhere, we're going to replace the air in this part of the chamber by carbon dioxide, which we flood out and bring it up. In the experiment, they bring it up to one atmosphere. And in here, it's just air, this is all sealed. And you end up getting some surface concentration of <coughs> CO2, which is pretty much fixed. And then the question is, okay, so how does that mix? If this is steady axisymmetric flow, then the gas that gets dissolved up here is just going to follow the outer stream surface as it falls around. And you're not going to get great mixing because it's still going to be diffusion limited. So let's see actually what happens in the experiment. So in the experiment, this flooding is done by these three big diffusers, which they pump in a whole lot of CO2 that displace the air and, and they get the CO2 to one atmosphere before they start rotating the lid. And then to actually see what's going on, because you can't see CO2 dissolved in water, soda water is just, just as clear as pure water. So they introduce um, dye at a couple of ports out here 
In retrospect, this is not the best place to put it, as we found out after we did the simulations. But anyway, they introduced dye here and here, introducing dye, very dilute fluorescein dye, 20 parts per million, at a very slow flow rate, some very small fraction of the velocity of the knife edge, so it's not to disrupt stuff. But nevertheless, it changes the volume, so to keep this interface flat, they extract the same volume of bulk water through these two ports here. Because we really want to keep this interface flat so we can actually characterize what's going on very carefully. So let me just show you experiment. So this is just with air. And this is where we had the uh, outer part of the chamber replaced with CO2 at one atmosphere. Everything in these two experiments is the same except for the gas outside. So the Reynolds number characterizes the ratio of the viscous time scale, the, the radius of the knife edge squared divided by the kinematic viscosity, and the inertial time scale, one on how fast the knife edge is rotating. We're keeping that in the experiment and also in the simulation I'm going to show you at 600, which is small. Anything below about 1500, this flow without the CO2 remains steady and axisymmetric once it's spun up in some fraction of the viscous time. The uh, buoyancy effects of the CO2, characterized by the Grashoff number, instead of a temperature gradient, I'm going to use the concentration of the CO2 at the interface compared to zero concentration elsewhere. So that's this Grashoff number, and that's about 9,300, very approximately because the coefficient of volume expansion is not well known for CO2 in water. It's got an uncertainty of about 25%. So I'm going to be messing around looking at what the effects of different Grashoff numbers are because of that primarily. The Schmidt number, how diffusive the CO2 is in water compared to kinematic viscosity is large, it's 500. So there's a viscous time, this is about three minutes. The diffusive time scale for CO2 in water is 500 times three minutes. Hours, two and a half hours or so. All right, so, <clears throat> and as I said, you know, the aspect ratio is 2, 2 and so forth. All I want to point out about these experiments is that everything's the same except no CO2, CO2. And there's obviously a difference. And can we characterize what that difference is due to? All right, so some model assumptions. <clears throat> so we're going to assume that what happens at the interface because of the CO2 become equilibrates straight away, and that concentration of CO2 at the interface is equal to the partial pressure of the gas in the experiment, it's one atmosphere, times Henry's constant for uh, CO2 in water. That's going back to the 1800s from Henry. So that tells us how much with CO2 we have at the interface. Like I said, the uh, CO2 changes the density, but it changes it very slightly. So we're going to use a Bosonesque approximation with a linear equation of state. This alpha, the uh, bugbear, if you like, it's only known to us in about an uncertainty of about 25%. And that impacts how well we know the Grashoff number. Uh, so the governing equations, this Navier-Stokes with a buoyancy term, and the ejection diffusion for the concentration of CO2, non-dimensionalized using the radius of the knife edge as a length scale, the viscous time as a time scale, and how much concentration I have at the air water interface at, to non-dimensionalize the concentration. Because it's actually symmetric, because I'm keeping the Reynolds number sufficiently small, I'm going to 
rewrite this using a string function vorticity formulation where the three components of velocity, which only depend on two spatial variables, the radial and axial, and time, can be written in terms of the angular momentum, right? So the angular momentum is just r times the azimuth of velocity, and then the derivatives, the various derivatives of the string function. So the azimuth flow is all governed by the angular momentum. The meridional flow is described by a string function. Take the curl of that, and now the meridional flow is all in the azimuth component. This is the azimuth component of vorticity, which drives the meridional flow. And the other two components of vorticity are given by the azimuth, the angular momentum. So we're going to plug all of this into our governing equations. And <clears throat> this is the equation for the angular momentum, right? Just the total derivative, how it affects and how it diffuses. Same with the concentration, how it's advected and how it diffuses. The interesting thing is the azimuth of vorticity. This is governing the overturning flow, which I want to get my gas to mix with. And so if I start off with no azimuth of vorticity, E to equal zero, that's all gone, that's all gone. And the only change in azimuth of vorticity then is due to two fundamental effects. One is vortex line bending. If you have any axial gradients in the angle momentum, right, then your vortex lines are not vertical, they're bent. They can't be bent just radially, they get bent with an azimuthal component, right? So axial uh, gradients of angle momentum generate azimuthal vorticity. And you've also got the buoyancy effects here. Radial gradients in concentration lead to a baroclinic production of azimuthal vorticity as well. And these two ways of producing azimuthal vorticity compete. And it's that competition that's going to give me my good mixing. All right, so the boundary conditions, I've been told five minutes, so I better hurry up. It's basically just no slip, and I have no flux of CO2 through the solid walls, through the floor or through the side. And on the axis, I have symmetry conditions. And then at the knife edge, on the top, right at the tip of the knife edge, I basically have no slip again, right? So the angular momentum is given by how fast it's going around. <clears throat> and there's no flux through the knife edge. But at the gas-liquid interface, I'm going to use a Boothenesh driven surface model, which describes the stress balances in, in terms of both the Marangoni effect, but I don't have any concentration gradients I'm going to show you, so no Marangoni effects, and surface shear, uh, viscosity effects. So, because I've been, you know, in the experiment, we're very careful to keep the interface flat. There's no axial velocity, so that normal stress balance is trivial. In the radial direction, the setup has a very small capillary number, and so that if there's any non-uniformity in the concentration gradient, a minuscule amount of Marangoni is going to bring it back to uniform. So again, there's no radial velocity. So at the interface, the only velocity component is purely in the azimuthal direction. All right? And <clears throat> taking into account the surface shear viscosity, which we characterize by this Boothenesque number, which I guess I, uh, did I write it up here? Anyway, so the Boothenesque number is basically just the excess surface shear viscosity divided by the bulk viscosity and a length scale to make the dimensions right. 
And what I'm going to use is a Buffon-S number of one, which is not too viscous, but it's viscous enough for our purposes. And in, at the rest of the interface, inside the knife edge, it's just got air above it, so the concentration is zero. Outside, it's got whatever is due to the partial pressure, so non-dimensionally it's one. So that's a setup. So let's have a look at what happens. So these are the angular momentum, azimuthal vorticity, and the concentration when you have Grash off equal to zero, so it's no CO2. With CO2, these are snapshots at different times up to one viscous time. And pretty much there's no difference until about it gets to steady state. And then if you look at the animation going beyond one viscous time, so this is no CO2, CO2 at one atmosphere, right? It's not much difference until the CO2 builds up enough. And once it builds up enough and you've got a, a big enough radial gradient, you've got the baroclinic production of azimuthal vorticity that competes with the azimuthal vorticity from the angular momentum axial gradients. And you get unsteadiness. It breaks this transport barrier because now you no longer have steady closed streamlines and you get mixing. And it mixes in a very interesting way. So, you know, you can look at Lagrangian mixing of passive scalars, right? And so this is an experiment from Escudia in 84 or something, and then he, we, we simulated his uh, problem. So this is a very similar thing. So it's a completely filled cylinder, just water. Here the bottom's rotating. You can flip it on the top if you want to get a bit of perspective. And once the, uh, <clears throat> the Reynolds number, how fast the floor is spinning, gets above about 2,500, the steady flow becomes time periodic. And so instead of having um, fixed points, hyperbolic fixed points that have separate tricks, the unsteadiness makes the stable and unstable manifolds of those not coincide. So you've got the uh, horseshoe map, basically. So this, these are just snapshots. This, this structure is pulsing like a swimming jellyfish. And each period, this lobe maps to this lobe, this lobe maps to this lobe. Here, I'm coloring the uh, numerical dye that I'm releasing with age. So the colors map to age. So new dyes, blue, really old dye is bright red and you can see very good mixing in some regions, but absolutely no mixing where you've got these transport pairs. These are basically cam tori. And so this is a snapshot taken from the central part of the cylinder. If you release dye away from the central region, you've got a closed streamline in the steady state, in the unsteady state, that closed streamline breaks up into hyperbolic and elliptic fixed points, which also give you this chaotic C that is well known from effective mixing. The problem here is that you need to crank up the Reynolds number a lot to get the mixing, right? We don't, we want to be well below that 2700, around 600. In, in passive scalar, it'd be steady, lousy mixing. So, <clears throat> so here's the, the nominal experimental grash off plus or minus 25%. What happens over many viscous times? To characterize the mixing, we have a look at the spatial mean of the concentration. It's growing and it's standard deviation, right? So the standard deviation is also growing because initially it's all concentrated along the out of things. And it's not until the gradients become large enough, you get this unsteadiness now induced by the um, baroclinicity. If you look at it uh, over a bunch of different Grashoff numbers, the angular momentum and the vorticity basically don't show any temporal variations unless you really squint hard and look in here. Here are the concentration gradients. You can see these oscillations start off at very early times, the larger 
Grashof numbers, and at later and later times, as you decrease the Grashof number. But so these are high frequency, and then these lower frequencies, if you see it's oscillating, then bang, an inner transport barrier is broken. And then you get more gas in there, and bang. You can look at the uh, coefficient of uh, variation as the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean, and early times, the flow across all of these Grashof numbers is independent of Grashof. It scales with a, this is a slope of minus a half. It's all dominated by viscous diffusion until you get the baroclinicity causing the unsteadiness. And if you rescale time with the Grashof number, that all collapses and that's all baroclinic mixing, enhancing to a slope of minus one. All right. If you scale up the problem by cranking up the Grashof number by an order of magnitude, okay, might, you could think of that as 10 times larger um, partial pressure, but you can keep the partial pressure and just scale the size of your, of your experiment by a factor of roughly two. And now the baroclinicity kicks in much earlier and you get really fantastic mixing. I'm going to leave this on while I entertain questions. Thank you very much uh, for this great talk, and I'm sure that uh, there are, are there any questions? Yep. Let's see. This is more informational, but my understanding is you you have velocities in all, all three dimensions. In all three directions. That's right. So, and you're imposing one in the azimuthal direction. And the, you're imposing a velocity in the azimuthal direction. Yeah, the, the, the knife edge is just rotating. And, That's right. And the, and the velocities in the r and z directions are developing from these forces? Yes. For, yeah, it, it, you get angle, you know, vortex lines coming off of the edge of the knife edge. They can't terminate in the interior. They have to come up to the surface. If that surface is inverted, it comes up very close, and the overturning is just really small. If it's viscous, because of the viscous coupling, the whole interface is rotating, and so those vortex lines come in at different regions, and you get large-scale overturning. It's, it's that vortex line bending that's driving the hydrodynamic overturning. Um, thanks for the really fascinating talk. Um, what is the Reynolds number associated with the flow that develops after the black baroclinic instability? Is it obvious that that's still small? So the Reynolds number is an input parameter. It characterizes how fast this cylinder is rotating to, compared to the viscous time in, in the water. So well, that, that stays constant. There'll, there'll be a Reynolds so what number. What you're asking more is a prognostic, you know, what's the velocity in here? Well, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm saying you have a large-scale overturning flow, and there's a Reynolds number associated with that. And that overturning flow is setting right. up a, a, an instability, and that instability relaxes, and that generates a velocity field, which isn't the same velocity field that you imposed stirring your knife. So it needn't have the same Reynolds number. Like I said, the Reynolds number is your control parameter. It's how, right? What you're asking is what happens, and what happens is summarized in these space-time blots. Right? Yes, yeah, so I guess I'm wondering, you, you, you see that uh, in your far right hand, your, your GR is 12,000, sorry, the, the movie. Yeah. The, the evolution that what prompted the question was that the evolution looks much faster than the, uh, so this is the, 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 the this increasing is the time this is, relative this to this. This is the CO2. And yes, there's lots of interesting time variations. The flow hardly changes. Once it reaches a viscous time, it hardly has any effect, right? Yes, if you squint really hard, you can see some very faint variations, but it's minuscule. And they're driven by these oscillations, but there's very little feedback. So if you're asking what the Reynolds number would change because of this instability, some fraction of a percent. Right, and, that, and that's why I put these space-time diagrams here, right? It doesn't change with time. 
more than some fraction of a percent. But the mixing is dramatic. That's the point. I think we have lots of room for discussion during our coffee break and so on. So I would like to take this, take this opportunity to thank all the speakers from our first section, Fluids in Realistics um, uh, Environments. So let's thank last.